<clears throat> Never get to see them all. There's a couple I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fun. Hi, Diane. Hi, who is it? Martin Urquhart, a long time no see. Oh, how are you? Good. All the way back from the Banff days. Oh my gosh, Martin. Wow. Yeah. With Paul okay. Paquette and. Yep, way long ago. Jesse's still up there, I guess. Jesse Jesse Tavish. Tavish. Yes. Alex, Billy Alexander was a grad student. And... Yep. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's a long time ago. Goodness, so I thought I better pipe in. Sorry, yeah. guys. It's old home week here at the, at the Glacier it is. Conservancy. Yeah. Zoom, we're bringing people together. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, it's, it's great to see so many faces. I see we're well represented in Woodside, California. Dick, good to see you. Uh, Janet Brandt from Missouri, always here. Gary in Connecticut, thank you for joining us. Willie Mays Hayes, uh, runs like Mays, uh, hits like Hayes uh, in Helena. Uh, board members, Lana Batts and, and um, Susan Hay Patrick uh, and Karen Chickering are with us. Uh, we are really delighted tonight to uh, be able to have an incredible uh, guest. I uh, was bold enough, um, having never met her um, two years ago, I was walking on the trails with Julie, my wife at um, Heron Park. Uh, and uh, Diane Boyd, the Jane Goodall of Wolves was walking up the trail. And so I said, hi, Diane, you don't know me, but will you do me a favor? Um, and she is incredibly gracious and um, said right away um, how much she would love to help the Conservancy and um, how much our work means to um, means to her and, and to the work that she does. And so um, we had to take a little bit of a, there was some problem last year that didn't work out. Um, so um, now that we're in 2021 and we have a whole new horizon, uh, Diane was gracious enough to, uh, to join us. So thank you um, very much for, for doing that. I see we are um, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania is well represented um, by Marion Bing. Thanks for for joining in. We have uh, over 115 people already. Uh, we had more than 200 sign up tonight, which is um, why I'm doing a little bit of a filibuster. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Diane um, briefly. And then Diane has been kind enough to put together a special presentation for us tonight, including some really up-to-date data um, and conversations she's had recently with researchers. So you're gonna hear tonight uh, from Diane, um, both the history of 40 years of, of wolf research and also what's really happening today currently. So um, it's really an exciting time. We'll expect that to run till about 10 minutes or so past the hour. Uh, and then we'll have um, some questions. Again, use the chat room uh, liberally for your questions. And we're happy to um, answer questions online and also to, to advance those to, um, to conversation later on. Feel free also to just unmute yourself and and blurred in, this is a family gathering after all. So um, as we like to say, it wouldn't be a uh, successful Thanksgiving and someone left someone left the table and said, I, I, I'm leaving, I can't stand my family. So uh, there are no rules here um, at Glacier Conversations. Um, so um, Diane, as, as, uh, as you all know, has had a distinguished career uh, here in Montana, moved to Montana full time in 1979 to attend the University of Montana from which she holds bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees. Uh, and she has worked not only in Montana, but really all over the world. Uh, and I double checked with this with her earlier, British Columbia, Alberta, Ellesmere, Isle Royal, Arizona, New Mexico, Romania, and Italy. Um, so this is uh, when we talk about somebody who has a, a global uh, knowledge of of a species, um, we really are um, honored to, to have someone who brings that um, uh, to us tonight. She's also uh, training a young bird dog uh, currently, so uh, that, that keeps her very busy. Most recently retired from uh, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, but if I've come to know Diane at all, I know that it really is, is just she was tired and then retired, and now she's just going to get tired doing other cool stuff <laughs> again. So. Uh, Diane Boyd, thank you very much for, for joining us. And um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I want to thank the Glacier National Park Conservancy and all of you for attending. And I have to tell you, when I left Minneapolis in 1979 to head for some place called Moose City, which is nothing, and the northwest corner of Glacier Park, and I arrived at this old turn of the century homestead with falling in cabins, and it became my home. And the first morning I woke up, 
and I saw the sun rising up on those Glacier Park peaks, I thought, I am never going back to Minneapolis to live. This is home. So I, I just love Glacier and I appreciate all you guys do for it. So thank you. So I think I'll just go to share screen and let me know if this is all working. You want to come over and watch? That's looking good so far. We do, we have, we, you have somehow muted yourself, however. How's there we that? go. All right, now the That's bar better. is on the top of my screen and covering up my, um, this. So you can, if you drag the black portion, you can drag it to the side. Got it, there we go, thank you. It's like, that didn't happen a moment ago. So we'll start <laughs> the slideshow from the beginning. There we go, come on. It's like having 125 tech assistants. <laughs> And it's, I'm doing slideshow and I'm hitting from the beginning. And it's, are you seeing my slideshow? So I have a thing that says resume slideshow on my screen. Maybe that could get chosen. Do you see that? This didn't, oh, there it is. Thank you. Okay, how's that? Bingo. <laughs> Bingo, take, sorry, it, thank it you takes very a, much. It takes a village. I have a PhD, it's not in technology, okay? <laughs> All right, we'll get rolling here. So I'm going to um, talk tonight a little bit about uh, where we've come with wolves since I first came here in 1979 when we had one. And now I can't get it to advance. There we go. OK, so tonight I'm going to cover wolf recovery in Montana via dispersal. And that's a very important term. In 1979, when the first wolf arrived, to present day 2020 as my data goes through because it hasn't all been done for the, obviously for 2021 yet. I've been working for the University of Montana Can you hear me? Got it. I don't know why it keeps muting me. I'm not touching anything. Okay. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Western wolf recovery through dispersal and reintroductions and challenges um, that have come about because this wolf recovery has been probably the most successful recovery story of an endangered species in the United States. I can't get my slides to advance. What the heck is going on? I'm really sorry. This has oh. never happened. It's all good. We're going we're gonna to make it work. There you go, like Wolf Ecology 101. Thank you. I, I keep getting a screen that you keep muting me, so maybe you don't like me, but I'm going to keep going anyway. So um, Wolf Ecology 101, a little bit about wolves that make them so successful is that they're a social carnivore. They're family-based. They're terrific dispersers. They're very territorial, so they, they keep other trespassing wolves out to protect those territories. They have a very high birth rate, that's fecundity, and they're highly adaptable. Sorry. My slides won't forward. I don't know oh. what the heck's. It's all right. We can, we can, uh, we will work this out. Um, um, so one of the options might be to go back to a little bit smaller screen and then maybe we can just choose the slide from the left hand portion. Never had this happen. That's okay. We'll get it figured out. Yeah, yeah. Let me try this. Can you see that? We see you. We just see you. We don't have a sharing screen yet. Okay. I'm really sorry. I don't know what's going on. This is never no, happened. And we even and we even tested in our tech check. So I know we did fine. One option may be for you to co-host somebody else that's techno savvy and they can take over and perhaps start the slideshow. I am techno savvy. I've done this. I just did this two, I did this half an hour ago and it worked. I'm really sorry. We'll get it figured out. Yeah, so. 
I don't know what to say. I can't uh, try again. Share screen. I've had the exact same thing happen. So just never had this happen. Yeah. Let's try this. We're going to go yep. again. Okay. Slideshow from the beginning. There. Can you see that now? Cannot. Not yet. You haven't shared it. We're not getting the sharing screen portion yet. I'm hitting shared screen and it's not showing the option. Oh, darn it. I've never had this yet. I'm so sorry, you guys. I can talk without slides, but they yeah. really make it. As so a, is, as the, a, is there a professional here? It might be easiest, Diane, to have somebody else show the slides. It could be a permissions issue or a presenter issue. And maybe you can talk and somebody else, if you can email the slides to someone, then they can. <laughs> it's no. enormous. Yeah, I think that's our that's our that issue. Work. It'd be a, a, a permissions issue on your machine or on uh, Zoom. It might help too if everybody is on mute because it could be a bandwidth issue. That's what I'm wondering. This is I just did this two weeks ago. There it is. Okay, everybody has to mute. Everybody except me. Let's try that. Can you see that? We can. And, and also we can. stop videos. Stop videos too. That increases bandwidth. That's the problem, I think, is the audience. There we go. How's that? That's great. Okay. Now it's working just fine. We had to shut off all that other noise. There we're going. Okay. Ah, well, that killed 15 minutes. But anyway, you know the history of the um, process of the wolves being killed out of uh, the West and kill off 90% of the population by 1930s. But cultural shift came along and the ESA passed uh, the Endangered Species Act and wolves became protected in 1974 in Montana. So Bob Ream with Wolf Ecology Project started all of this going back in the, the early 1970s and he was my mentor. And they, um, he, I have to say he, he did so much for me. And now I can't advance my slides again. I miss Bob dearly. So do I. Well, so I think we should go old fashioned. Okay. I think that, you know, if you want to look at them and guide us through them, we, we will, okay. we, we want to hear from the expert and I think we ought to, <laughs> we ought to declare victory. <laughs> Alrighty. So you can't see my screen, right? We can see you. Oh, yeah, but I'm not going to look at. You could be looking at wolves. Anyway, I'll just read the slides, I guess, and I can try. I've never had this happen, so I don't know what to see. Um, it's all good. We're here for you, Diane. All right. Hang on a second. I think it's because my brother is watching and something has happened. <laughs> now my cursor. Wow. And okay. none, of us are, none of us are wolves, so you won't hear any howls of protest. Okay. All righty. Well, well said, Gary. <laughs> okay, so actually I've got two PowerPoints open. That might be part of the problem, apparently. Try this again. Okay, so, excuse me. Anyway, the thing, interesting thing about the park, I went through the park historical data and I talked with John Waller this week. He's the head uh, biologist there, carnivore especially. So he didn't, know much more than what I could come up with. But in the Glacier National Park historical data is that the early rangers used gun straps and poisons to successfully eliminate wolves from the park by 1936, so there were no more. Um, there is a black wolf head that's mounted, and I think it's in the archives right there in the West Glacier Park from a wolf that was shot in Big Prairie in 1953, and then a wolf was shot in Pole Bridge in 1970, and that's kind of the extent of the wolves there. But the thing I have to emphasize is that when the wolves began coming back with that first wolf, Kishnina, whom we put a radio collar on in 1979, um, she stayed and reproduced. She found a mate, a three-toed male. And these wolves walked down from Canada. They were not brought there. They were not dumped out of trucks. <laughs> they walked down from Canada. And they probably came up from Jasper and Vamp, actually, because there weren't any wolves from Waterton area up there. 
So they were not brought here by humans. And it was really fun. I arrived on the scene with the first wolf, the first one in 1979, and managed to stay with the program until right now, we've got about 2,000 wolves in the Western United States. So Kishinina and her mate had a litter of pups north of the border of Glacier Park. Um, and there were seven pups born. Uh, she, Kishinina, something happened to her. She went away. And then a new wolf came in. And in 1986, this new wolf, Phyllis, and her mate denned in Glacier National Park. For the first time in 50 years, there had been wolves denning in Glacier Park in 1986, just north of Polebridge. And that pack became the magic pack. So that's kind of how wolves got to Glacier. They were not put there. And the thing that's really interesting is that people don't know that there were even wolves in Glacier Park. I mean, I've talked to so many people who you see in Yellowstone and all they think about is reintroduced wolves. So anyway, wolves got there on their own, they walked down. Um, I guess I won't bother to try and put on the slideshow because you won't be able to see it, right? Should I try it again? Feeling brave? Like we have a I'm lot of people brave. with their I cameras really want off. This to work. So, so if you're feeling brave, let's do it. We, again, I'm going to try it. This one is family. Time. We're 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 not trying to win the Academy Award. We're All just, right, one more we're time. Just having fun together. One more time. Maybe we'll see if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah, and maybe if we leave it like that, and then just okay. try and you know, I'm thinking. Let's do that. Let's go. Then with you that. can just click on the next slide. There you yep. go. We will try now, that. I'm really sorry, folks, but this is better than folks, nothing. And if folks need to move your the bar of pictures, you can move down that to down to the bottom by grabbing there. the black portion. Great. Okay, this will make it go this way. This will be interesting, a little miniature version. So that's a picture of myself and Mike Fairchild, um, another very dear mentor who's lost and gone. I kind of want to dedicate this talk to Mike and Bob. But we went through the usual early stuff of how you collect data on wolves and all the hardcore field work when there was very, very little technology. This is pictures from a wolf we caught in, uh, up in the Sage Creek Flats in Northwest Corner Glacier Park in 1984. So that, uh, 86, excuse me, one of those first pups. We had a lot of volunteers. They were amazing. They, they worked for absolutely nothing. They didn't get any pay. We gave them an old mouse infested cabin to live in and, and uh, write in the rain notebooks. And that was kind of it. And we depended heavily on volunteers. And many of those have gone on to become amazing, amazing young professionals in mentoring other conservationists. And I stayed friends with a lot of them over the years. So you got to put the frame of mind back in the 80s. There was no such thing as a GPS or a cell phone. There were no spot devices. DNA wasn't being done anywhere. And there were no laptops. Everything was done with paper. And this is a picture from the, the airplane with the antenna on the wing. I was up searching for one of our wolves that had gone missing and I ended up flying way north of Glacier National Park with paper maps on my lap and I ran out of the maps. We had no idea where we were. We kept flying and flying and I heard a signal beeping. And so I listened and it got louder and louder and louder. And eventually we circled around and we got it within our circle and we dropped down and there was this wonderful female wolf who had disappeared off of Glacier Park uh, about a year earlier. And there she was, it was February breeding season. She was with four other wolves. And she was obviously the delight of the adult male in that pack and soon to be bred. And I was so excited because we found her and we had no idea where we were. So I turned to my pilot, Dave Horner, who was the best pilot I'd ever seen. And I said, so Dave, where are we? He looked at me and he says, I'll fly and you read. And I didn't kind of get what he said. And then I, he went and he just dropped down and there was a closed highway, the Kananaskis Highway. It was all snowed over and we flew along that highway with the skis just above the snow level and I was writing down the names of the exit signs as we flew by so we could later go back and figure out where this wolf was. So that's how we that's how we found uh, out where we were and went and bought paper maps in Fernie and uh, that's how we figured out where she had gone. So the interesting thing about this is that the Montana wolf population prior to Yellowstone wolf introduction was about 70 wolves starting from Glacier Park and they dispersed down through Marion. They colonized the Nine Mile and they were doing pretty well just colonizing um, areas in through Northwestern Montana. People don't know that. Most people think wolves arrived in Yellowstone. The interesting thing about these wolves from Glacier Park, if you look, if you can follow my cursor, I caught this little wolf 8551 at the very Northwest corner of Glacier National Park and in 1987, she took off. And again, one of these just disappeared. Despite my flights, we could never find her. 
if you follow this red line trajectory, Doug, can you see my cursor moving? Yes. Okay. She dispersed straight line distance in seven months, 550 miles. Now she may have gone further when she was shot, she was up by Fort St. John's. And so for the Yellowstone and Idaho reintroductions, half of the wolves came from Fort St. John's and half came from Hinton. So she went through that Hinton population up north. So the wolves that they took for the Yellowstone and Idaho introductions are one wolf population connected to here through all of that country. And this little tiny 80 pound wolf showed us she can walk that far that they're all connected. They're all, they're all native wolves. If she would have gone south, the blue line, instead of going north, she would have ended up about 100 miles south of Yellowstone Park. So clearly Yellowstone Park's within dispersal uh, range of that for that wolf. Oops. And so this is a quick map of what the reintroduction plan was going to be. And you can see the only place where wolves were fully endangered was the Northwest Montana recovery area. The reintroduced wolves were all called um, experimental um, population. They were non-essential experimental and you could kill them if you needed to kill them or remove them. So they took the wolves, they reintroduced them, they put 31 into Idaho, 35 into Yellowstone over two years. Um, and the wolves have done really, really, really well. And now the populations have blended. The Northwest Montana, Central Idaho, and Yellowstone have blended. So this is a map just showing only 15 years of wolves from 1983 to 2008. The dispersal era, areas, arrows, it does not include our long disperser who'd be way off this map, but just to show you how far wolves go, they've gone to Colorado, Utah, Oregon. They actually have gone to Nevada, obviously colonizing Washington, Oregon. Uh, and this map is old because there's so many dispersals now, we, we can't even keep track of them to map them. So kind of the nuts and bolts, the facts of wolf management here in Montana, that the recovery goals to get 150 wolves or 15 breeding pairs were met in 2002. So very early on, uh, our Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks Management Plan was accepted by the service, Fish and Wildlife Service in 2004. Wolves were delisted in 2011 in Montana and Idaho and in Wyoming in 2017. So right away, hunting and trapping seasons were started by the Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Um, the program to monitor these wolves has been totally funded by license sales and Pittman Robertson dollars, which is a tax on sporting goods equipment. It costs about 400,000 a year to run the program. On average, about 20,000 wolf licenses are sold per year but there's no limit to the number of licenses sold. And every person who buys a license can kill up to five wolves per person. So they're, they're unlimited. That is gonna be changing probably with one of the present um, bills that's in our legislature to make it more liberal. Uh, Fish, Wildlife and Parks does not do livestock loss things. That's the job of the USDA. The Livestock Loss Board for Montana pays out 65 to 85,000 a year for livestock loss because wolves do kill livestock. And an interesting little law, that one right there that I got the statute number on, requires Fish, Wildlife and Parks to collar all packs that may come in contact with livestock, which is basically every pack in Montana, except for the Kintla Lake pack up in Glacier Park. And the last one is especially important because wolves were delisted in January of 2021 in all of the US, except for Mexican wolves. So that was done under the previous administration and that's gonna make a huge difference for uh, wolf recovery efforts and most states will open up hunting and trapping seasons on them. So that's kind of the science behind it, but wolves don't live in the world of science. They live in the world of social media and strange tales. And I don't think, I should write a book on the number of things that I've heard about wolves stories. It's just amazing. So, um, so how do we combat misinformation? Well, you know, that's a, a very, very, very difficult thing to do. So I've gone on to, uh, if you're interested at all, I, I've lifted a lot of this brand new research data right off of the Fish, Wildlife and Parks website. And you can go to fwp.mt.gov. So very interestingly, I went specifically to look at a lot of the ungulate studies because the claims are made that the wolves have eaten all of the deer and elk and stuff. So. There was a moose study done that Nick DeCesar was overseeing for seven years and they collared moose in three different areas in the western Montana area in the Rocky Mountain front in the big hole and over by the cabinet yak area. And 
of the, all those wool, or all those moose, 71 collared adult moose died of various causes. And you can see by the graph here, the biggest cause of mortality, it's like 55, 60% or so, was health related for the moose. And some of those things we don't often think about how climate change can affect our wildlife. For example, we don't get cold enough winters anymore to kill the winter ticks that are a huge problem for moose. So winter ticks, diseases and parasites are killing a lot of moose and they die of, they die of hypothermia, they don't have any hair, they starve. So these health related have nothing to do with predators. And if you look in the smaller graph, this little dark green bar was bear, predation by bear. These are adult female moose. Now think about that. Uh, this next bar over was predation by lion. This, this pie shape here is predation by wolf. And this was a little added uh, predator cause because it was a moose that died later from an infection from wounds from a predator. It doesn't say which one. Interestingly, if you look at human caused, this is hunter harvest here. This is illegally shot. And this is one that got hit by a car. So really, if you look at the, the wedge of the pie, the number of wolves, excuse me, moose that were killed by people versus the number killed by wolves, more people killed more of those moose than wolves. It's just the data. <laughs> that, that's, that's just fact. So were wolves the culprit in our, our moose decline? Don't think so. The unknown is just the moose were too decomposed or too little left to, to figure out what killed them. So the, another number to look at, and I hear that um, people say we can't get an elk anymore. Their numbers, they're just the wolves have got them all. I, this is just data. So this is a hunter harvest in Montana from 2004 to 2019. And on the vertical axis here, it's zero to 30,000. And this is the years from 2004 to 2019, the last year. So overall, the statewide harvest of elk is slightly up since wolves have come back. Wolves have been here all these years. Northwest Montana, it's slightly down, but not hugely down. So again, that, that's what the science and the data say. In terms of the elk studies, they just published a final report, 2020, on the bitter at elk study, which included the bitter and some of the, um, the Clark Fork. But interestingly, I'm quoting exactly from the report, harvesting more mountain lions provided a short-term increase in elk calf recruitment and population growth. Just meaning that the more lions they killed, the better the elk survived. And the more interesting part is the second part where it says, um, there was no evidence that liberalized harvest regulations for black bears and wolves, meaning they could kill the heck out of black bears and wolves, and it didn't have any impact whatsoever on elk calf survival or recruitment. And that rates of wolf predation on marked calves in the Bitterroot study area remain low throughout all of the years, despite variation in wolves harvest regulations, how many wolves are harvested, and minimum wolf counts. So lions killed most of the elk. Just again, another little interesting piece of data. The next study I downloaded was um, just published again in 2020, a uh, multi-year mule deer study over a large area in Northwest Montana. And this is a, the chance of it, of the deer lasting living for one year, annual, annual mortality rates. So if you look, the top killer of the mule deer, again, mount lion, wolf, wolf coyote, and unknown and human are about the same. They're like 1.01% uh, chance. And so mountain lions, again, were the biggest killer of the mule deer. But when you talk to sportsmen's groups and you tell them all this data and you tell them there's three times as many lions in Northwest Montana as there are wolves and everybody kills deer and elk. I mean, people, bears, they winter kill, they get hit by cars, but it, People still tell them the information and they still say, but the, the wolves have killed all the deer and elk. So I, I don't know. I don't know how to better reach people than give them good information and science in a format that people can look at in graphs. But opinions still uh, don't match reality in some cases. This is a, a simple chart. It just shows you what percent of what wolves die from. So the bigger legal harvest kills the vast majority of wolves and the different colors are just different years. So of, these are all known 
wolves that are turned in and radio collared wolves. So there's a little bias in this, the way it's reported because we know that they come in because they have to be tagged. So second, second biggest killer down is agency control for livestock depredation. Third down here is um, defensive property, which is people shooting wolves on site that have in their cattle. So basically all of these here are direct human causes. And then we get quite a few that are hit by cars and trains. And then there's illegal over here. And there's a tiny amount bar on the right that would be for natural mortality. So if we look at the number of uh, depredations, the gray line represents sheep. They got into a big sheep farm one year bad in 2009. Uh, the black line is cattle numbers going over the years with 1990 through 2019. And again, numbers on the vertical bar. And the number of wolves is the dotted line. And what's interesting here is you look at the number of wolves and they go up and up and up and up. And they kind of tip over right about here. And as soon as they tip over, you see the amount of depredations is going down. The reason they're going down is because in that those years right in here, there were so many depredations. Wildlife services came in and, and hit on them pretty heavy to reduce depredations and uh, it was successful. But the bottom line is that the vast majority of wolf mortality is human caused. And that's true no matter where you go. It doesn't matter if it's in Midwest or uh, here, or the exception to that would be Yellowstone where the, the majority inside the park, majority mortalities are wolves killing other wolves. So how do we count wolves now? So we've gone to a system called the Patch Occupancy Model or POM. And it's an estimate, it's not an actual count, and it's pretty cost effective. And it became the way to count wolves instead of trying to count individuals uh, two years ago. But as the wolf population expands, it's, it's just impossible to count wolves and they're very secretive and they live in a forest environment where you don't get to see them very often. And I won't, because I lost 10 minutes on the front end of this talk with the technology glitch, um, I won't explain it, but just to say it's a model it's based on phone surveys to hunters regarding wolf sightings, and it determines the number of wolves based on the number of sightings. There was a constant throughout this all the time with an assumption that a wolf average territory size was about 600 square kilometers or about 232 square miles. And interestingly found that as time went on and people were getting more and more effective at killing wolves through shooting and trapping, the territory sizes got smaller and the packs got smaller. There was more disruption of the pack. So just last year, that model was revised, become an integrated POM. It's new and improved. <laughs> and so the trend is the same for the different um, years and different models. It's just that it goes up, it peaks out in 2011 and all the counts and all the parameters and it's just slowly declining to a little bit stable and the count estimated for last year was that there's uh, 1,136 wolves in Montana. And again, that's an estimate of the actual number of wolves. This is some work done by Sarah Sells. And what we have the graph on the left is the number of packs. The graph on the right is the number of wolves. The bottom line is years. So what you can see is originally we had lots of packs and then again about 2011, they just started declining to sort of stabilizing to slightly declining. And same with the number of wolves, peaked out in 2011, and then it just sort of slowly tipped over. It, it's really interesting to me, the most important thing I think is on this graph, this is the harvest rate or the percent of the population that is killed by people each year. And if you look at 2007 to 2019, remember the year where the population stabilizes and drops off is right here at 2011. And yet the percent of the hard percent of the population that's being trapped and shot keeps increasing. So people are getting better at finding wolves and harvesting them. It's interesting to me. So right now they're killing about a quarter of the population through trapping and hunting. And if you add in the wolves removed from wildlife services and illegals and all that, it's about a third of the population every year. If you want to know the actual numbers, so here's the calendar years. This is hunting plus trapping. 
This is control for killing livestock. And so as you look, the total number that are killed by people kind of started off low and every year it goes up and up and up. We don't have the estimates yet for 2020. Um, it's not completed, but again, that's a significant portion of the population that's being killed every year. So if you took and harvested one third of the grizzly bears in the population, they would wink out. The grizzly bears are slow reproducing. So how does Montana's wolf population remain stable at such a high level of harvest? Well, as I explained, because there's so much disruption of the social structure that the lead animals, the dominant animals get killed. They're a very tight family group in terms to breeding. So you have disintegrating packs. You, know, you have smaller packs and smaller home ranges. So you end up where you used to have a pack of 12 with one female reproducing. Now you have two packs of six or three packs of four and every those females reproduce. So you're having more females reproducing and they're producing more pups. So they're just cranking out the pups. Um, and that's the way that they're able to um, continue increasing. Let's see if I can get that to play. There we go. This is a picture of the Murphy Lake pups that I got on my trail camera just west of Glacier Park. So by having lots more pups, pups are more vulnerable to all kinds of things like trapping and disease, but they're cranking out two to three times as many pups as they used to. So that's how they're able to, to endure that. But the biggest question is, so the wolves, the wolves are doing their best to, to keep, keep reproducing, but how do we create social tolerance? Because um, social tolerance is going to be the only way that you're going to be able to have wolves on the landscape. So the best way to do that is through collaboration, uh, not legislation. And in a good example of collaboration is we started a range rider project up in, in Trago, Montana, not too far from here. And that was a collaboration of a bunch of people that normally wouldn't sit at a table together. It was Natural Resource Defense Council, Defenders of Wildlife, you know, Wildlife Services, which is the agency that kills depredating wolves, the Forest Service, Vital Ground, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and then six different livestock producing families that were multi-generation on the landscape that had their livestock leases in forested lands. So the first thing was just to get all of us to talk together. And the next thing was to to hire, to raise some funds and hire a range rider, which is basically a cowboy or cowgirl that stays out on the landscape. And they're out there all summer. And just simply having somebody out there riding around in the, the grazing allotments was pretty, was successful in reducing uh, predator conflicts. So when you have less cattle losses, you have less grizzly bears and wolves killed for it. Um, so we all, had, we all had different goals. You know, the ranchers want less cattle killed the, the conservation groups want less wolves killed, but we came together and we were able to do that. And we, another group, uh, anonymous group donated a lot of cameras. So we were able to document with cameras um, where these wolves were and then the range rider would call the producer and tell them they got wolves on their allotment. So it was great for building relationships. It was a wonderful way to do that. Some of the other things that don't work so well is uh, through legislation. And I don't know if you've been following what's been going on this session, but it's not just wolves. There's a lot of things. It's been a very hard session on a lot of natural resources for the state of Montana. So the one bill was signed, that was Senate Bill 224, and that allows for the snaring of wolves. And their snaring of wolves has never been allowed. And so that is now law, the governor signed it. Senate Bill 225, extends the wolf trapping seasons to open two weeks earlier and stay open two weeks later. That is not a law, the governor signed it. And what that is likely to do is it's likely to increase incidental captures of bears, particularly grizzly bears and potentially grizzly bear cubs, which is very frightening. We had one in, once an incident two years ago in the Swan where uh, a guy trapping uh, in early December he did indeed catch a grizzly bear cub and um, the mother was free, very angry and running around. The other cubs were loose. It was complete chaos. And he, he could hear that cub bawling before he got up to it. So he was able to not go all the way up and he went and called the department. Fish, Wildlife and Parks had to go out with armed people and helicopters and oh my God. And I suspect we will see more of that now that the season 
is open earlier and staying open later. And as climate change comes on, the bears are denning later and coming out earlier. So it's not going to be very good. Senate Bill 267 has been called the wolf compensation bill, but it's a bounty bill. And they're going to be paying bounties on wolves that are trapped. And that has not been signed yet, but it's been transmitted to the governor's office for his signature. And then there's the wolf reduction bill, which is in process. It's gone through the various committees. It's not up to the governor yet. But that bill, the, the state and intent of the bill is to reduce the Montana wolf population through a variety of means to bring it down closer to the minimum of 150. And there'll be no bag limit for hunters. So if you buy a wolf license, you can kill as many as you want or trapper. There won't be five, it'll be as many as you want. There'll be night hunting with artificial lights and night vision scopes, and they'll be allowed to use bait. And so all of those are new, new, new laws that hadn't happened before. So there's kind of good news, bad news, excuse me. So if some, some of the legislation is kind of bad news. The good news is wolves are incredibly resilient and they try and find ways to, to keep building the population but I think the most effective way to, to help keep wildlife on the landscape, I don't care if it's a grizzly bear, uh, bighorn sheep, or wolves, is you have to create value for them. And, you know, everybody's got a different value about wolves. You might have an economic value. So if you're a motel owner in Gardner, Montana, wolves bring in annually $35 million to the ecosystem down there through gasoline, lodging accommodations, meals, you know, hiring guides, interpretation. So it's a huge economic boon. So you maybe you want wolves there. You know, if you're a scientist, you know, the, or you you want to really feel the natural values, they have an ecological value. Perhaps Perhaps you live in uh, San Francisco and it has an aesthetic value to you. You'll, you'll never get to see one, but it, it makes your soul feel good aesthetically just to know that they're on the landscape. Maybe if you're Native American, they have a cultural value to you. Maybe you see them as kinship or a spiritual power. Um, if you're an academic, it's an amazing research opportunity and they've done so much powerfully amazing work in Yellowstone. They have a lot of support and funding there and I don't unfortunately I don't see that in Glacier I don't understand it um, there's essentially no no wolf research going on in Glacier Park at all and the fish wildlife and parks occasionally radio collars will observe but the park service does not have the funding to do anything and I think it's really sad because they're missing a good opportunity and then there's a recreational value so for recreation maybe your recreation idea is to go sit on the side of the road with the scopes in Yellowstone Park and simply watch wolves and it's a huge social event people are sharing thermoses it's, it's pretty amazing and I'll be going there myself in about uh, three weeks or maybe your idea of a good recreational opportunity is to go out and stalk and sneak up and, and kill a big massive trophy wolf and and that hunt becomes a part of your, your uh, wildlife memory. And that wolf has a value with that. But right now, to a lot of people, wolves have no value, none. Matter of fact, they probably have a negative value. And when that happens, there is no reason then that people want them on the landscape. So we have to work on creating value. The future for wolves, given all this, <laughs> is still pretty bright in my in my mind. And I'm not rose colored glasses on this stuff. I've dealt with a lot of angry hunters and ranchers and dead wolves, but wolves are very resilient. They're like coyotes in that respect in that, look how well they've done. We've gone from one wolf to over 2000 wolves in a short time, in my lifetime. Um, they will keep reproducing, they will keep dispersing and trying to find each other. It's just what they do. We're really blessed in Montana that we've got places like Glacier National Park and the Bob. It's a huge refugia with, with adequate prey, but a lot of their habitat is out on the private lands because in the winter time, the big game animals don't live on the rocks and snow and ice. They have to come down to lower elevation so they can feed and browse and, and, and survive. So it's not just having wild places that are protected like parks. They also have to have the community the ranching community in the forests around in the private lands to help them make it because 
the majority of wolves, you know, can't just make it in Glacier Park, but um, it's very important. Um, in Northwest Montana here, mostly we deal with uh, anti-wolf feelings from hunters. And the other regions of the state, they're mostly anti-wolf feelings from, from ranchers because of the livestock issue. So they gotta have um, tools in place to, to address both of those. But I really believe that wolves are here to stay. I mean, they made a huge comeback, uh, unless there's some massive, massive swing to poison all the wolves like they did in the early 1900s. They're just here to stay and their population's gonna go up and down and you can kill a heck of a lot of wolves before the numbers start to decrease. And I think the people passing these bills will find the wolves are smart, they're sneaky, they're hard to find, and they, and they probably aren't going to end up killing a lot more wolves, but there's quite a buffer to go. And this, I say this all pending social political favor. So as long as the social political favor and administrations remain somewhat conservation oriented, they'll be there. The best part for me as, a, as ecologist is that the Northern Rocky Mountain wolves are no longer three separate pockets. They're, they're all connected from, from, well, almost from Colorado now, from Wyoming, all the way up to the Yukon and Alaska. It's one continuous meta population. There's no inbreeding. There, there's thousands and thousands of wolves. And so when wolves wink out of one place, they manage to disperse into the next. We've seen wolves go to Oregon, Washington, Utah, California, Colorado, Nevada, and even Nebraska. And there was one in Missouri a few years ago too. So wolves will make it wherever we tolerate them. It's the only thing they need. They need to have freedom of persecution from people. They need to have some refugia in which they can raise their pups and they need to have adequate prey. And if they have those three things, they would live in Des Moines, Iowa <laughs> if they could, but they can't make it there because they don't, they're missing some of those things. So we will continue to see wolves expand their populations a bit more yet and show up in other places in the United States. But I don't think you're ever gonna see wolves in, in uh, making it successfully in the open countries like Nebraska, Illinois. We're more gonna be in the wilder areas like the West um, and, and North and the Great Lakes states and doing really well with their wolves too. So I wanna thank everybody and particularly the people on the screen. And I'm really sorry about the uh, technical. I've never had that happen and I've given scores of PowerPoints on this computer. So I don't know what it is, but we managed to get through it, but you did get, didn't get to see the fun animations. But anyway, so with that, I will unshare my screen and I'd be glad to take questions. Well, Diane, that's terrific. You know, and as, as the old uh, saw goes, you don't, you learn more from someone about how they react when things don't go well rather than when they go well. And I think we all did well. Um, <laughs> I think that we reacted well. Thank you for being nimble and, and, I tried. Uh, and, and patient. No, it was great. I, and, um, I learned a ton and we do have some great questions. My coworker, Jill Bridgman, um, has been, uh, helping go through the, the chat and some of those questions. And I, um, have put in the chat and if you'd be okay. I've spent a little bit more of your time. We usually end at the top of the hour. Um, yep. And I've, I, if we can all hang out till about 7.10 or so, I think that'll give us some time to get to a bunch of these questions and, and have some discussion together, if that's okay with you, Diane. You bet. Great. Jill, um, we got some great comments in there. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to just start um, kind of heading down the list here. Um, so someone had commented about a documentary called The Trouble with Wolves that came out a couple of years ago and it presented this negative impact of wolves um, on ranchers' livestock. So they were wondering, is there a balance that can occur with the wolf population and ranchers in your opinion, Diane? Well, it's happening right now. I mean, the balance is happening. There have been wolves here for 30 years. So you may or may not like the balance, but they are living together and where they're causing livestock depredations, the wolves are removed and where they're not, they live. So I, I don't know what to say. So yeah, and some ranchers have more trouble than other people, but they are coexisting. As a matter of fact, a lot of these really critical wildlife lands that wolves make it on private lands are these huge ranches in Montana. They're absolutely essential for that wolf survival, for that pack to be there. So if, if you know, if the landowner is willing to tolerate them there, great. And if they end up killing a few cattle, 
wolves are removed. And that's the balance. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions about elk populations. Someone asked, um, beyond the data and the numbers, are there other methods or studies that um, assess the health of elk herds and any data from prior to the, um, the surge of wolves, I think is what they're asking, any data from prior to wolves versus after um, regarding the elk herds? Where, which elk herds, what time period? I'm sorry, that's such a general question. I mean, Fish, Wildlife and Parks has been doing monitoring of elk herds for decades and they do a elk flyover surveys throughout much of the area and they do elk harvest surveys. So those are always done, done. but in terms of the research and relationships with predators, that's pretty new. That elk bitterroot study is available. I encourage that person who's asking to go to the website and read on it. It's been a lot of stuff published on it. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a lot of work been done in Idaho as well um, and Alaska with wolves impacts or not on different game populations. So sure. I, I don't know what to say with that. Did I answer that question? Yeah, I, I think to the best. And, um, and Tanya, if you wanted to um, elaborate or if you wanted to chime in, feel free to unmute yourself too if, I, if I'm not um, asking the question appropriately. Um, but yeah, so, someone else actually did have a question in regards to um, the elk hunter harvest in Northwest Montana specifically. They asked, given the slightly reduced elk hunter harvest um, here in Northwest Montana, do we know if the elk population there is stable or decreasing or increasing? So the, that chart that I had had that on it. Do you want me to go back to it? It was there. Yeah, and I don't, maybe they had asked it before you got to that slide or not. I'm not sure. Okay, so. Um, okay. So the population in the state overall, in the entire state, I think I heard the fact that only two units out of all of them are, are not at objective or over. So there's only two. In Northwest Montana, there's been a slight decrease, slight gradual decrease for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. And we can't say that it's wolves. I mean, all these studies that I just showed, it shows that lions are the biggest predator of it. Well, the other thing that's going on is we've been having massive forest fires right now. And not too long after the forest fire, the browse is great for elk. But after 30 years, that dog hair lodge pole is like this. I mean, a snowshoe hare can hardly get through it. And these fires, because of the fire suppression we've had, they're massive, you know, 30, 40, 50,000 acres. So that influences it. There's a lot of things that influence that. And, it, and wolves are part of it. There's no doubt. I'm not saying they're not. They're not angels, but there are many factors that play into that. Yeah, that's great. Um, someone asked, let's see, do you think that D I asked if that was a wolf pelt on my wall. And yes, it is. And I take the pelts and the skulls and the collars around when I do educational talks. Yes, it is. I saw that printed. <laughs> great, thank you. Um, Someone asked, do you think the delisting of wolves was based on science and recovery goals are being met? And a second part to their question is, what do you think the likelihood is that they will end up back on endangered species lists with the new hunting laws? Those are really good questions. And really technically the wolves were met their goals long ago in the Midwest and they should have been delisted if we're looking at the standards that were set, the guidelines for the Dangerous Species Act, those wolves should have been delisted in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota many years ago, just like they were here. So I have no problem with them being delisted there. They're, they got like five, 6,000 wolves, something like that in the Midwest. It's, it's a huge number of wolves. And in terms of, do I think it was a science-based decision? No, because if it was science-based, it would have happened a long time ago. I think it was a, a, the administration, previous administration, was making a statement because they delisted them throughout the United States everywhere. And there might be places where maybe their comeback will be slowed, like to Utah or Colorado or something, because they're now delisted. But um, scientifically based, there's plenty of wolves in the Rockies and the Midwest. And there's some holes in between where they can still infill and the protection may have helped that. Yeah. Um, someone commented about the Superior National Forest Wolf Monitoring Project um, and how they're looking into non-invasive methods for wolf monitoring. 
uh, involving more cameras, collecting yep. DNA, acoustic monitoring. Yep. Um, and she's wondering, are any non-invasive methods being looked into here in Montana? That's a great question, because I pushed for that a lot when I was working for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. So in the park, they're doing a lot of camera, camera uh, surveying work. I did a lot of trail camera work. The one thing that the state does not do, which many other places do do, it's very inexpensive and is using DNA work. And you can, you can just like they did for the glacier grizzly bear studies, you can, you can survey wolves very easily with DNA by going and collecting scat in a, in a, in a standard method of getting them at the rendezvous sites, but the department doesn't want to go that route. And, and I tell you, I mean, cost effectiveness, the amount of time and money spent on radio collars and tracking and dropping, I think that it would be more cost effective to do it with DNA. And they've gone to that work in Idaho. Mm -hmm. So between cameras and DNA, you can be completely non-invasive and track those species. But if you remember my slide about the law on the books that requires every pack in the state of Montana that might come in contact with wolves to be collared, it's an archaic and impossible law, but it's still on the books. So who knows? Yeah. Um, we've got someone from Colorado who commented that um, up until last year, only five or six were known to make it across uh, southwestern Wyoming to Colorado. Yeah. Um, so he's wondering, you know, it's taken a quarter century after the Yellowstone reintroduction yeah. and they still don't have a population in the Southern Rockies. So is it just the landscape, Wyoming's predator zone? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. <laughs> it is it is the landscape um wolves don't get very far across the open wyoming country um and they've had a hard time so those wolves that made it to colorado in moffett county in the northwest part of the state they've actually reproduced pups two years in a row so they're reproducing but they're right on the border with one with uh, wyoming and i was just talking with the colorado parks and wildlife people this week and they don't see any signs of those wolves. There's just one or two now. So they get, they live literally miles. They, they mostly are in Wyoming. So when they cross into Colorado, yeah, they're good in Colorado and Wyoming, they're predators. So I, I can't help but think we were at that point in 1979 as well. It only takes a couple. And yeah, it would just, it's reintroduction is instant gratification. And the natural recovery is a much slower process. Mm. Each one has its flaws and, and positive things. Sure, yeah. So I can give you a little, and you may have already seen this, <clears throat> um, Diane, but I can give you a little data from those cameras. As you know, we're in year three of this landmark link study that the Conservancy yeah. has been funded through the gracious donations of people like um, you and, and many of the people on the, on the Zoom tonight. Um, and that's the final year, year three. So we have two years of data, 150 cameras in the park. And I just looked up, um, we have 79, captured 79 photographs of wolves, photographs or videos <laughs> of wolves in the park, um, nine wolverines, 114 lynx and 272 uh, grizzly bears. So um, wow. we're, it's, it's great. And you know, that's a John Waller project and yep. uh, they have just submitted a new grant proposal um, to us to fund a wolverine study uh, going forward, which we're very excited about. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what would, if, if you had a magic wand and a bag full of money, um, what would a wolf research project look like um, in or around Glacier Park, maybe a connectivity project, um, if you had a magic wand and a big bag of money? <laughs> I'd love to do the DNA work and um, camera work. It would be of interest to put a few GPS collars around the whole park, not just the North Fork, but the, the Middle Fork and around the Rocky Mountain front and to see how those wolves survive when they're passing back and forth through the filter of the landscape on the forest. We, we just don't know. We get wolves shot all the way around the park all the time. The only buffer strip is right along the North Fork area for, there's a sub quota for two wolves killed there and the rest of it's wide open. But I think do amazing amount of work with simply DNA pickup and cameras. That that would be what I would want to see. And I'd be interested if people would put in the chat if you've had a chance to see a wolf in the park. You know, Julie and I have been hiking in the park for 40 plus years. Um, I've never seen a wolf, but I've heard them uh, on numerous occasions, which might huh. be scarier, <laughs> especially when it's the pups over here and the mom over there. 
Yeah. Um, but just yeah, put in, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just like to pipe in to Diane and Jill uh, further to the previous question. Uh, you made a little comment there, Diane, about wolves shot around the park. So to the person that was talking about how long it took to get a wolf to get to Colorado, uh, how many wolves leave Yellowstone Park and don't get very far? <laughs> and well, that's to that, I, I would repeat, I would say, my, I know, I know, but the thing is the wolves that they know about that have made it to Colorado, they, so between, I took the slides out of this talk because I didn't have time, but there was approximately like seven or eight wolves in a period of 10 years that were collared, that made it to Colorado. These are collared animals. And what percent of the population is collared? 1%? So I'm saying there are a lot of, there's a lot of wolves that get there. They, but they just, they get shot, they disappear. They go back into Wyoming. They, you know, they don't have a very long life in Wyoming, let's put it that way. Yeah, I just go by our experience just north of you. Yes, yes I know. Believe where, me, I know. Where Alberta is a sink for your wolves. It sure is. Yeah. 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 So, so before we lose too many people, Jill, I think we promised a giveaway tonight of, um, of yeah, all things, you know, better lucky than good. As folks know who have, have um, gone to the retail stores that we operate on behalf of the park, and if you shop at uh, any of the visitor centers, those stores are run by the conservancy and the money is, uh, profits are given back to the park. Um, and we always do a shirt every year commemorating um, an animal in the park. And this year, uh, that animal happens to be the wolf. Um, so tonight- Good choice. Uh, yeah, right. So, <laughs> so, um, so tonight we're going to give away one of the 2021 uh, wolf t-shirts. Just We just got them in a couple of weeks to go. They're really cool. I was going to wear mine tonight, but um, I- decided I'd dress up instead. Um, and so Emily, when you are prepared to uh, let us know who the winner is, you just pipe up or tell Jill and we'll... Uh, um... I, I, yeah, I do have the winner actually, oh, Doug. Um, yeah, can you see the photo I shared too? I just want to make sure yep. folks can yes. see it. Yeah, um, and this is designed by our friends at Wild Tribute and we, yeah, they're just so great. And it's so new, none of, like only Doug has a shirt so far. So I would have worn mine tonight too, but I don't have it yet. But um, yeah, so our winner tonight is Emily Tracy. So congratulations, Emily. Great. We will uh, connect with you and make sure we get you the right size and mailing address and all that good stuff. So, but yeah, you are the winner of this lovely shirt. So how can, yeah, how can people buy them? There it is, how to buy them, okay. There it is, yeah, glacier.org. Um, yeah. And they're available on our, on our website as well. Yeah. So uh, glacier.org, and then you just click on the shop tab. A quicker way to get there is shop.glacier.org and then yeah, it should be like a featured product on our on our site. So it should be pretty easy to direct to. Yeah. I'm really, really sorry about the technical glitches. I'm glad you got the pretty t-shirt to finish up with. <laughs> yeah. No, Diane, that was uh, awesome. And the, and Doug, you too. And I'm I'm new to this, but um I love the shirt. It's beautiful. And I really enjoyed this whole conversation tonight. Thank you. Well, great. Thank, Thank you. Thanks everybody for uh for kind of hanging in there with us. Um it you know it's a, sometimes technology i like to say bill gates sometimes doesn't like me and i don't know why um, <laughs> but you know i i think it um you know the wolves have been such an iconic part of the american west right for for such a long period of time and to think about um the work that diane you have done we are so privileged to be where we are when you if i if i listened correctly when you came to montana in 1979 there was one wolf. Yes, one, the only one outside of the Midwest. We now have way more than one wolf and that doesn't happen without people like you um, uh, really giving of yourself in service to us as a state to bring back something that is iconic to the American West. Um, you know, you can, from a very young age, you can close kids eyes and we can all hear a wolf howl in our head, right? And so, um, you know, sometimes we can forget the commitment that it takes to go from a place where we are almost have extinction of a keystone species to a place now where we're talking about, you know, um, fairly large numbers um, and, and again, continued problems. But thank you for your service to to us as a state, we are um, forever grateful and to be really honest, forever changed 
by the work that you and others have done um, in this community. So um, saying th thank you for that. Thank you. Glacier's near and dear to my heart and I'm glad to help you out. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, we hope you'll join us again and, uh, and we'll, um, we'll uh, hopefully have better luck with, uh, with technology. <laughs> Um, but we're, we're always learning. And again, our apologies as well. We, um, uh, we want to bring you smooth uh, and exciting programming with Glacier Conversations. And, um, and we, uh, we uh, thank you so much, Diane, for being with us tonight, for all you do for our communities. And um, we'll look forward to seeing everybody uh, again here soon. Thank, thank you. And can you hang on a minute after we sign off? Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye -bye. you so much, Diane. It was a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just, just fabulous. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah.